Welcome to LEA 560 Leading Diverse Teams. This is lecture four, and today we're going to be talking about the Gardner analogy of leadership that's found in Team of Teams by General Stanley McChrystal. And I think it's very interesting because we've been talking about complexity theory, and we've been talking about silos and some of the different things. This lecture will kind of bring at least all of that together. So I think it'll be very important to you and very interesting as well. First thing in Team of Teams is that it's the idea that you're trying to take your particular team, possibly your organization, and you're going from a command style of leadership, which is the traditional top-down structure, uh, to a team of teams. And sometimes that ends up going to a command of teams. For instance, you might have a situation where that you have uh, different departments and you have this department, this department, this department, this department, and you will find that that's pretty normal. But then how do you get all of these folks to work together? That's what complexity theory is all about. That's what this book, Team of Teams, is trying to teach. And so how do we get to this? And specifically, what we're going to be talking about is not so much, okay, we've talked about the purpose of it, which is adaptability. We've already discussed that. But then what we need to look at, so what is the role of the leader? What am I supposed to be doing then? Uh, what are you supposed to be doing? That's what we're going to be talking about today. Now, you will find that the Gardner analogy is very similar to natural church development theory. And I am bringing this up because the, in the similarities, I think you can see some very significant things that overlap and are pretty important to this. So let's just take a brief look at natural church development theory, and then I think you'll make the connection when we go on over to the Gardner analogy uh, for leadership. The Probably, I guess, one of the foundational scriptures of natural church development theory is 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 6. It says, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. The whole idea of natural church development theory is this idea that there are certain things that we do to improve uh, how do I say this? To improve the environment of, of our churches, to improve the quality of our churches. But ultimately, it is God who makes this thing grow. So the, the object of natural church development theory is not uh, focusing on numerical growth, but rather focusing on quality and believing that the watershed of that will automatically produce growth. In fact, one of the things that is brought out in natural church development theory is that there is an automatic, um, it's built into churches, it's built into the framework that if things are right, if they're healthy, they will grow. Healthy things grow. And that's kind of the, the rationale behind it. Now, they talk about how that there are eight characteristics, quality characteristics, that seem to be evident in all growing churches. Uh, the one, and, and by the way, the adjective in all of these eight quality characteristics are really the, uh, the factor that's important. So, for instance, empowering leadership, the idea of empowering is extremely important uh, you know in terms of of your leadership and the gift-based ministry are people ministering according to their gifts 
or is the pastor coming up with that we need this program this is where we are now let's try to find some people that have these gifts and maybe some you know so it depends on that a uh, passionate spirituality are people passionate and then there's effective structures are your structures your your organizational structure is it effective and conducive to what you're doing you kind of see where this is going inspiring worship service uh is is your worship inspiring uh holistic small groups is it more than just a bible study uh do they address life's issues with their members uh, are they actually is it more of an apprenticeship type thing where that you're actually sharing the life uh, need oriented evangelist uh, evangelism uh, which is related to the needs of those that you're trying to win. And then there are loving relationships, not just where we're just casual acquaintances, but are there loving relationships? Accompanying these, they say there are six forces, growth forces. Um, and I thought I might would give you some synonyms that maybe help with this. So there's interdependence. Uh, another word for that or a synonym for that might be connecting. The decisions that you're wanting to do, the things that you're wanting to do, how is that going to affect others as well? Again, remember complexity theory, you know, the and especially chaos theory and the butterfly effect and how that one decision, one thing can affect other decisions. Sometimes it will, sometimes it won't, but it's the idea that you're intentionally thinking about this. How about multiplication? Uh, it's not merely addition. It's the idea of reproducing. So this is another growth force. Is what you're doing? Is it reproducing uh, energy transformation? And that is, uh, does does the decision take advantage of the resources in the environment? Are you harnessing what you have that you can actually go farther? Uh, sustainability, and uh, basically uh, sustaining. Uh, are you are you able to sustain what you're doing? Is there a certain amount of that? And then there is symbiosis, which is uh, talking about uh, with what you're doing, does it foster a fruitful cooperation between the different activities where we're all working together? Are we cooperating? And finally, a fruitfulness, uh, does it, produce visible fruit for the kingdom of God. I mean, you're evaluating this. That's what you're doing. Produce that. These are important growth factors. They all deal with these characteristics. And the idea is that if you can, and if, if you can focus on these particular things and make sure that these things are quality in what you're doing, then what will happen is naturally there will be, uh, and by the way, using these six growth forces, uh, that what will naturally emerge is a growing, healthy church. Now, here's one of the scriptures that is used in natural church, uh, or yeah, nat natural church development theory. And this is in Mark chapter 4, 26 through 29. I've highlighted some things, but notice what it says. This is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground night and day. Whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself. The soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, and then full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. It's the idea that this uh, if, if you'll make sure that the environment is right, that you will remove any of the things that would hinder, uh, and that's talking about weeding, that's talking about making sure that you uh, uh, are doing certain things, that the result will just by itself, and it's really not by itself, it's really through God that the church will grow. So the church is designed by God to grow, so growth happens automatically if we remove the obstacles that prevent growth. Growing churches use this growth principle. Now, understanding that, let's go to the gardener analogy of leadership. And you will find that it also 
deals with this idea that they believe that great ideas, great products, great decisions will naturally emerge when people are allowed to come together. And uh, so you, you see that. And I haven't forgotten about the fact that what are the leaders supposed to do? We're getting to that. But so many leaders are like a chess master. They want to be in control. They want to know what's going to happen 10 moves ahead, 20 moves ahead. They, they want to use a strategy. They want to make sure that they are in control of every movement that takes place on the board. It's not the way it is with a gardener. A gardener, we're, listen, there are a lot of factors that we don't have any control of. And all that we can do is create an environment that is conducive to growth. And then by doing that, uh, that, you know, we're, we're not intensely uh, trying to manipulate that. We're just creating the environment for that. So what do leaders have to do to go from this traditional organizational charge, the chart of scalability uh, to finally getting to a team of teams, scalable adaptability. And basically what it's saying, you can see it at the bottom and also at the, in the middle there. How do you, do, how do you go from efficiency, uh, an organizational structure of efficiency, boy, we can, we're, we're good at what we do, to adaptability, where that we can now have the shared consciousness where we can do this. What is the role of the leader in in this particular uh, type of of organizational structure the first thing that a gardener does the first thing that this leader does is create the space for great work i remember i had a uh, i decided to do a little garden and i thought i would just do it just uh it's a flower garden it's very beautiful and i put it by our fountain we have a beautiful little fountain that's got a little boy and a girl with a book and the water flows over it into the little pool that's there and uh so they they have this and i thought some beautiful flowers would be all around this this would be wonderful well the flowers that are around that now the other flowers that i have that are all along in my little flower garden are beautiful but those flowers they didn't grow very well uh Many of them died, they turned brown, they didn't get to the height they needed to have. What was wrong? The problem was uh, they got plenty of water and they got plenty of attention from me, but the problem was not enough sunlight. It was in that particular corner of my garden, the space was not conducive to those plants thriving and growing. So as a gardener, one of the things that I want to do is create the space for great work. What does that mean? That means one thing is pushing down the organizational structure and making it more from vertical to horizontal. I am allowing people to come and uh, to meet and to talk and, and it has to be intentional. It has to be intentional. So here's, here's maybe another idea of this. And what you're looking for is eyes on, hands off leadership. Now look at some of these things. Let's say for instance, that you have hands on but eyes off. That's a person that's decided that they want to be involved in what's going on, but they're really not, um, they, they really don't understand. They're not really looking at the consequences that are taking place. This is just the way that we do it. And they're not looking at what's happened. And, and I've got here, this is how fingers get cut off. And it's true, you know, because you're not paying attention. Your hands on, but your eyes are off. You're not paying attention to what's happening. Then you have uh, leaders that are hands on and eyes on. And you'll notice I've written here, they're micromanagers. There are people that have to have their hands in everything. They've got to make sure that they are, uh, you know, that they're involved in every decision, no matter how trivial or how menial, yet they have to be involved in this and they're watching everything you do. They're micromanaging you and they're dealing with this. Um, and the problem is, is it doesn't work very well. Then you have 
your eyes off and hands off. This is in the lower left quadrant. This another uh, type uh, of this leadership uh, is laissez-faire. Laissez-faire is not always bad, but in this particular case, laissez-faire. Laissez-faire leadership is basically just roll the dice. Whatever you guys want to do, that's fine. I'm not going to say anything. You know, uh, you guys are doing it. Well, the problem with that is that maybe they're going to stay on task, but maybe not. And then finally, you have your eyes on hands off leadership. This produces innovation. This produces effective, this is effective managers. Uh, this uh, allows for people to come up with uh, synergy and great ideas and great products, great programs because they're collectively working together. One of the things that you're trying to do is to gather as much information from as many angles as possible and then share it with people so that they can make the best decisions possible. Let me give you a great example. We had a, um, uh, we're, we're, we're constantly working on programs here at Grace Christian University and, and one of the things that I did as I was working on a particular program that we had is I decided to go to the student career services and talk to the folks that are there about this program. Now you would say, well, yeah, but you're developing curriculum and you folks are teaching and they're more into trying to find jobs for people, right? But I was shocked at how they brought up a perspective that I had not even thought about, hadn't even considered. And we took that perspective and we started grappling with it and working with it. And we, there was some push and some pull and, and we, we dealt with this. And I'm saying that to say that that's kind of what happens when people get together. I'm looking for information. I'm looking for different perspectives because I don't want things to just, I don't want necessarily for people to just do what I want. I don't want them to just agree to my decision. I want to make the right decision. I want to have the best decision. And so that's the reason why you want eyes on, hands off. So look at this. Now I'm moving from siloed teams to integrated team of teams. So I've listed some of the things then that the leader does. And we talked about creating that right environment and we have talked about eyes on uh, and uh, hands off, allowing them to actually do their thing, you know? What does that mean? Well, one thing you'll notice right in the middle of the little graphic on your right, you'll notice that there's a little man there, a little woman, it just depends on which one you want it to be. And there you'll see the first thing uh, that we have that kind of sprawls off to the less, left is develop a common purpose. This is sharing your vision. By the way, I would remind you, Bill Hybels, Bill Hybels has said, vision leaks. So you've got to make sure that you're continually, continually infusing the group with, um, you know, what's our purpose? What are we trying to do? Make sure everybody understands what is the overall purpose that we're doing. The other thing, uh, and this is the idea of eyes on them. You're making sure that people aren't straying or going in, you know, directions that have nothing to do with your program. So let's say, for instance, that you, uh, you're you trying to, you, you're putting this together and you're saying, boy, you know, one of the things that I want to do is to make sure that we, uh, uh, we're, we're going to work on a church growth program. And as you're working on a church growth program uh, and people are getting together, suddenly you find out that people are really talking about, um, you know, how that we can actually go ahead and, uh, you know, maybe we're going to talk about the different ice creams and ice cream socials that, well, the ice cream socials could be maybe something that you're looking at, but sometimes you can get, I guess what I'm saying is sometimes you can get detoured. And uh, I didn't come up with a very good example of that. But you can become detoured in the conversation. You've got to make sure people have enough flexibility that they're there. You're watching, your your eyes are on, but you're not intervening unless absolutely necessary. Uh, 
also spark connections that's another thing that you do where you're putting together people and you're 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 making sure that you're providing opportunities uh, for people to have sidebar conversations with one another and hallway meetings and formal meetings and creative meetings where that they can do this uh, empower people listen you've got to if you're going to delegate and say listen you folks can do this we want you to talk about it and come up with something you've got to empower them to be able to talk to one another to grapple with one another to to uh to make decisions uh with one another and then you have to empower teams um and this is important uh, you're empowering teams to do certain things, to accomplish certain things. That's their task. And working together with other teams that they can do that. All of this stimulates a shared understanding. These are the things that a leader has to do in order to make sure that uh, they're going to create an adaptable uh, structure and the idea the reason why the Gardner effect and uh, natural church development are so similar is because the Gardner is not uh, focused on trying to make it grow rather she is just working uh, the soil she's watering she's weeding she might be adding some fertilizer or some plant food but Basically, she is creating the environment so that it will naturally flourish on its own. And that becomes a great deal of the responsibilities of the leader. One other thing that I would say is after you have created your space and after you have gone through all of this, the other thing you have to do then is to maintain it. Because, uh, you know, there's in a garden... Uh, it can get overrun pretty quick with weeds and everything else. And so you have to constantly be vigil. I'm constantly looking at my little flower garden. And if I see weeds coming up, immediately I'll pull that weed. I don't wait until the thing's full and then have to, you know, spend the entire day pulling weeds and dealing with it and that kind of thing. But I take care of it immediately. My eyes are on, but my hands are off. I just let the plants grow by themselves and the same thing goes for this so this is uh, the gardener analogy of leadership and hopefully this will be a help to you as you're reading about it and team of teams uh, I'm looking forward to uh, interacting with you make sure you do your homework make sure you do your reading and uh, God bless you is my prayer